Hurling on Off the Ball. With Board Gosh Energy. Hurling. It's anyone's game. Now we're going to turn to the action yesterday. Very happy to say Christy O'Connor, journalist and author, is with us. Christy, great to talk to you. Yeah, you too, Joe. How's life? Great. I had your brother on yesterday doing live updates and uh, it's fair to say impartiality went out the window during one of his reports when he started screaming, ref, that's definitely a free our ref, come on. Disgusted at full time, but uh, we'll get into all that in a moment. And David Herity, five All-Irelands with Kilkenny, managing Kildare these days. David, great to have you on. Come on, Joe. How are you keeping? Yeah, very well. So I think at this stage, people are well aware of the drama of yesterday. Kilkenny 4-21, Galway 2-26. Uh, goal in the sixth minute of injury time, doing the damage. And then in Munster, again, the finest of margins, Limerick 1-23, Clare 1-22. Can we go big picture for a moment, fellas? I thought the uh, best line of the weekend was own Cody in his speech. And they say there's no hurling in Leinster. So, uh, how would you compare the two games, Christy, if we take them as uh, a showpiece of what both provinces have to offer in their respective finals? Yeah, well, obviously, Joe, I was at the, the Munster final. I, I just got the, the Leinster final on TV. Um, I, there, was, I, there was definitely a sense that the Munster final was nowhere near as competitive, as, in, as intense, as... Um, Hard hitting, like you know, like there was a lot of tension there yesterday. You know, a lot of pressure on Limerick to win the Munster title in their own backyard. A lot of pressure is what's unclear. Try and win a fourth Munster title in 25 years. Um, you know, you could definitely sense that that tension maybe got to the players a little bit. Um, like players' conversion rate was nowhere near what it needed to be to beat Limerick. Um, and I think, look at from from a you could you compare it to the Leinster final, Joe. I I, I couldn't say. Sometimes you have to really be at a game to to get a real sense of you know the quality, as opposed to judging it off TV. But um, like yeah, I think look at the biggest thing with the Leinster final for me was that like it, it threatened the game threatened to get away from Gola big time early in the second half. You were kind of wondering could this really get ugly for Gola going eight points down and then you know to haul it back, um, you know led by Connor Whelan who was was unbelievable really like one six from play one two assists, um, but like in terms of quality. I suppose you have to look at this in a broader picture, um, Joe, in terms of when you look at what the Munster Championship has produced mm. compared to the Leinster Championship this year. And I suppose this is an age old debate now where, you know, you're asking, you know, is the Leinster Championship, the like one had that saying about, they're saying there's no hurling in Leinster. Of course there's hurling in Leinster, but in terms of the bigger picture, of what have the Munster sides expended this year compared to maybe what the likes of Galway, Dublin, and Kilkenny have expended? And, you know, how much emotionally and physically is that going to take out of Clare yesterday? Um, and like you could argue that the biggest losers yesterday were Galway. When you look at the route, they now have to go to, you know, more than likely Tipper playing Offaly, more than likely that's going to be Tip. Then they're going to have to win that. They're going to have to play Limerick. Um, Kilkenny, I suppose, are going in now in a good position. Clear. The big question is what are they going to learn from last year? Because they just physically and emotionally never recovered from that defeat last year to, to Limerick after extra time. So you could say the Clare probably are going in to the semi final or the quarter final now in a better position you know to finish the game really well Joe like you were, there was a stage maybe with 15-20 to go where you were wondering could this be a, you know 7 or 8 point defeat you know clear dug in probably had a chance should have had a chance to level it had momentum to finish the game or you know finish the game with momentum so but in terms of your question about the quality like what have the Munster sides expended compared to what the Leinster sides have expended like there's no there's no comparison between in terms of quality like you can't say that the Leinster championship is on a par with Munster because you know you just don't have the same volume of high caliber teams there's obviously a lot more jeopardy in Munster when you have five teams looking for three spots you know um, you know you no, nobody's going to argue that Westmead Antrim you know Wexford Dublin are on the same level maybe that the teams in Munster have now, and the other side of this is that Dublin now Carlo you know awfully Leinster teams are going in the, the, the Joe McDonough teams have had a three week break so you could say that they're well set now. Where where the Munster teams, in terms of where Limerick have the four week break, which is really the biggest prize from yesterday. So, where the Munster teams are still hard to know, Joe. Oh, and I think uh, to be fair, sorry, um, David. To be fair to Own Cody, there's no doubt. Yeah, like there's no argument between Leinster and Munster championships on the whole. But if we just take the two finals yesterday, the two respective games, the you know the best two that Munster had to offer this year versus the best two that Leinster had to offer this year, how would you compare the quality that you saw? 
I thought in comparison to the 2022 last year's Leinster final, that was one of the worst games uh, I think we've ever seen. Kind of the quality of it, there wasn't any, there were very few goal scoring chances. There was no bit of atmosphere whatsoever. It took place on Saturday evening. There was just no hype to the to the whole Leinster final. This year was completely different. Um, it kind of it did feel, regardless if you're being truthful, it felt like the minor match after the senior match really. Uh, when you're when you're kind of setting up your whole day, the first half, you know, you're kind of barely getting into the Kenny game. You're kind of coming down off the whole last minute and a half of the the, the Le Munster final, and whether it was a free or whether it wasn't a free, and then you're straight away into the Kenny game, uh, Kenny Galway game. But I actually thought the last 15 minutes of the the Kenny Galway game, the Leinster final, was probably better than the actual Munster final. As I thought myself, I thought the quality of hurling, the point scoring. The, the, the chances that, that were created on either end, I actually thought for this this year, the final 15 minutes were just as exciting. And it was nice for the way it finished off. But, you know, that argument has always been around the Munster Hurling, Munster Hurling versus Leicester Hurling. Munster Hurling is is more competitive. It's more appealing to watch. Uh, I don't know I don't know how anyone can with a straight face can ever tell you mm. anything different. But it's the fact that, like, when Kilkenny played Galway, you know, you think back to 2014, the draw match and then the replay, even the, the year that Dublin bet Kilkenny in, in 13 after the replay in Port Leash. Once the Leinster final is in Crow Park, it's never going to be as exciting. It's never going to feel like it's as exciting, regardless of the game. Even when you had that replay in, in 2018, it was in Central Stadium uh, between Galway and Kilkenny. It just feels like it's more exciting once it's out of Crow Park. I have to feel Crow Park on any day. Yeah. just saps the energy and I still think if you were to ask follow up the question and go should the Leinster final be outside of Crow Park I'd say no I think anyone is giddy any player whatsoever wants to play in Crow Park regardless if there was four people on it, in it you'd still want to play there it's just that incredible feeling and it's and again the preparation wise if it is clear that come through the back door and can Kenny have to play them can Kenny have that experience in Crow Park time and time again and it's uh, it, it it obviously should or could stand to them again in a semi-final. Well, let's um, stick with Leinster then a moment. So, obviously, Kilkenny, the big winners, All-Ireland semi-final, four weeks' time, the likes of Adrian Mullen, uh, Richie Reid, Mikey Carey was ill, um, and a couple of others have a bit of time now to come back for a semi-final, Limerick into a semi-final as well, and similarly, Keane Lynch and others have a bit of time, and they can really focus their season as two games left. Uh, we'll come to Clare in due course, Christy. I take your point about the energy expended in Munster, but uh, David, I would definitely have that sense that Galway, I mean, they're in massive trouble here. That's a heartbreaking way to lose the game. Uh, the goals they conceded in different ways were all really soft and really terrible goals to concede, and that has to be a big worry. And now they're staring down the barrel of most likely Tipperary, a Tipperary side who are, you know, they've shown what they can do this year and they are disgusted that they threw away a Munster final appearance and they've been sitting on that for several weeks now. Get over that hurdle and then you've got Limerick and then you're into a final. I don't know. That feels like first nail in the coffin Galway. How do you see it? The only thing is, when you kind of look at, at Henry Shefflin's, um interview after the match there yesterday, he was quite upbeat about it. Like, first of all, he goes, I'm very proud of the way um, uh, the players played and we look forward to it and we regroup. But and I, know, I know a lot of managers do say that, but generally you can feel, you know, you nearly feel that it's just empty words. Yeah. Um, and it, it, he, they don't mean it. But Henry just, he kind of seemed to go, we'll get back at it and we'll have to, we'll have to. As in, this is where we're at. It's, it's he knows himself the job that he has to, to do it, the, the biggest thing for them then straight away um, and the focus in you talk about the the goals I thought that was the that's the toughest thing at the moment for any manager coming like when Henry's only after only in the job and it is only a year he hasn't even done the kind of the second year the full second year he has to go along and get so many things right the culture the backroom team first of all he has to get all the players so he's probably after ring, after ringing about eighty players. That's year one and getting the backroom team. Then, then the the obviously trying to sort out who he wants to keep on, changing up everything. And then you're kind of getting really into year two into your tactics and nailing that down. Yesterday is kind of is going to be a massive eye opener to the goals that he conceded they, that Galway conceded. I thought it was it was very naive defending. For me, it kind of. Um, the, the biggest difference I would have always seen with, I suppose, the Kenny defence from my own point of view in goal um, and a lot of the other defence defences, they always the other defences always seem to be marking their own men. They always only seem to care about their own defender, uh, and it seemed that way yesterday. Obviously, behind the goal, you could see this that 
when the ball was coming in, they were very, very touch tight, the Galway defenders. They were nearly getting sucked out the field, even though there was massive holes being left wide open. The likes of Dahi Burke, I thought, there just seemed to be miscommunication. Either it's there's no communication coming from Aina Murphy behind them, or else he, he can't hear it. And obviously that can happen sometimes in Crow Park. But for the goal, for Wally Welch's goal and for Mikey Butler's goal, twice he made the run to try and cut off the angle. He had been released. I think it was Marcy that was cutting across. That's where your keeper has to shout for your centre-back to go, cut that off, cut off the angle. But it wasn't. He went full throttle. Then he eased off, and that gave Wally Welsh then that kind of the still open space then to finish it off. And the same with Mikey uh, Mikey Butter. If you, if you watch those goals, you'll just see, you'll see him easing off. And that just, again, you have to go back. That's the biggest thing that they're going to have to try and hone in on. And, and, again, and David, even, the, even, sorry to interrupt, even the Kyogen goal, that's just that's two on two yeah. in the full back line. Two Galway defenders go up, crafty Kilkenny, one goes up, one stays down, break goal and look I know there's a freakish quality to the to the Buckley goal, but in hindsight you think where's the kind of composure to kill the ball one way or another? Do you know what I know I know everyone's saying I kick it out over the line, they ha- and they definitely had chances. If you scrap what happened in the, into the corner, you look across and you freeze frame it when Donnelly got the ball. Yeah. Keen Kenny's free on the 21 and Killian Buckley's free 25 yards out. Like if you look at, at Jason Flynn is standing, marking someone out around midfield, you're thinking you've got to get back and defend the D. Like you have to, again, uh, that's what I'd be critical of mm. uh, keeper-wise. You have to make sure your defensive awareness, if you freeze frame it, there's enough bodies, got these bodies back there, but who is marking who? If you're a midfielder, and again, I know Conor Whelan was back in the corner even again, I know Cooney was, but your half forwards, corner forward, someone's got to get back and realise my cor- the cor- kick any cornerback is not dangerous. Yeah. Or the centre back is it. Get back into where the danger is. And I know obviously Park Man, it was a it's it's a terrible kick. And obviously a hundred things happened in that thirty seconds for the goal to go in. Yeah. But just that bit of cuteness again and that that again as I said if you look at Limerick would that have happened they probably not they would have had like they've had before their last year in the semi-final they bring back Kyle Hayes in case a high ball is coming into the square they just know how to kill off a game mm. what to do uh, in those final few minutes and Galway are just they're still on that, that journey because they're only a year and a half into a new management yeah Galway Christy do you care to make the case or would you share the big concern that it's, it's too difficult to root now and they've too much to get on top of well, I suppose the biggest challenge, you know, is like the inconsistency and trying to earn out those inconsistencies which have plagued them, really. And, you know, to win the all Ireland, they have to win three big games, you know, which is a big ask, like, of any team. And it's probably a bigger ask now goal of when, you know, they haven't done that. Like, even in, you know, even the, the Dublin game, the last, uh, you know, round robin game, like, they were just, they were non-existent, really, in the first half. Dublin kind of did with the light for long periods. And that's been a kind of a team, you know, it was there again yesterday where, they're just kind of letting other teams get get a grip, and then they seem to be chasing. When you're chasing the whole time, you know it does, you know, it kind of leads breeds that kind of inconsistent kind of a, uh, I suppose, just confidence more than anything. Because I think with with Galway, Joe, a lot of it seems to be down to belief, where you know, um, like you know, you see that even with the way they struggle to bring for, bring through their their these unbelievable players that are underage. So you know, you just wonder, like, is um, you know, is that a factor? Um, and then you know, look at their their playing tip now. Um, more than likely, all you know, all respect to athletes, yeah. good chance it's going to be tip. And you know, if you look at those games, go back, go all the tip games. The last, you know, it was, it was an incredible rivalry in the middle of the last decade. You know, they met in um, in the twenty twenty championship in the Gaelic Grounds. There's nothing in that game. There's going to be nothing in that match. So, and then you know, you win that show, then you have to get it up again for for Limerick in a semi final. Um, you know, as you said, if they win that, they have to go again in a final. Can they do that? You know, the, the, the form lines would suggest that they can't. But mm. then again, look, there's still a lot of experience in the team. Um, it must be very frustrating for Henry. This was the biggest criticism you would have had of Galway, you know, prior to this year's league, really, even during this year's league, was the kind of lack of identity around the team. You know, you were kind of saying, well, you know, are, are they a mirror image of their manager? You would have said that, you know, I'm sure Henry was some of those league games, especially the core performance. He must be nearly tearing his hair out saying, like, you know, what's the story or where is this inconsistency coming from? You know, they were down to clear you know, be clear well in the league game in Ennis. Um, and you were kind of, in fairness then, I suppose it, the, the team is settled, right? Compared to maybe, uh, you know, that that's one thing that they have they have in the team. They've, you know, pretty set look about it. But they still struggle, Joe, to have that consistency. And that was an issue with, with Gawler before they won the All-Ireland in 2017. Yeah. That was the biggest thing that Mihal brought to them 
you know, during those two years was that consistency. So, um, you know, can they find it again? Like, it's a big, big ass Nojo with three to win the All Ireland is going to take three big performances, you know, for a team that haven't really shown that level of consistency in those big games. David, I've noticed uh, from your fellow former teammates a real outpouring of happiness on Killian Buckley's part. Yeah. His 12th season, never scored a championship goal before. This is worth about 30 championship goals, I would think. Um, he's had a lot of hi- uh, trouble with injuries, his hip, I think, and, and probably various other parts of the body as well. Give us an insight into a fellow like Buckley on the road for 12 seasons, not necessarily rolling off the tongue when we're talking about Kilkenny over the last decade. Uh, first of all, he's probably the, the most genuine lad you could meet. I, honestly, after the match, there's just, regardless of the result, just the happiness from, about Killian Buckley scoring the winner. He is, I, I would, I'd, I'd say, I'd argue if, if management had remained, I don't know whether a few of those lads there yesterday, Wally, Killian, Connor, whether they would have stayed on. So, ironically enough, just the change of management has brought a whole new lease of life, and you can see it in Killian. Killian's the kind of lad he, he's. He's extremely dedicated in everything he does. He has a, Jesus, he nearly has a physique or a body like a Greek god. The man looks after himself incredibly well. He's the kind of lad, you know, if you were having a give him a role, he'd take the old dough out of the middle. Yeah. You know, and everything that he does, he's that meticulous in everything that he eats as well. I spoke to him there a few weeks ago and he was, uh, he, I said, is there anything kind of different? He seemed very happy in himself and how things were going and he just kind of went, I'm just enjoying it again. I'm just enjoying it. I'm probably not putting as much effort no, sorry, wrong word. I'm not putting as much uh, pressure on myself anymore. I'm just starting to relax a little bit. And he would have been like that in the past. If we, I know after 2013 when we lost to Galloway or to Cork in the quarter final, everyone went out, you know, and went on to Bruce Springsteen. Killian wouldn't. He would take it very much to heart after a loss. Um, he was always like that. But but just to see him scoring a goal, ironically enough, it's gonna, it's it's I'd say his, his fiance is probably pissed off enough because uh, he's booked his, he booked his wedding thinking the All-Ireland final was on the same date as 2022 we booked it for the week after it. but it's now the actual his, uh, his wedding is going to be the day before the All-Ireland final so he's after making a bags of it and then to go along and score the goal to basically put them within one one game away from having the worst uh, night of his wedding uh, it's interesting enough it's yeah the, the Sorry, he's, he's, there. he's still getting married is he? <laughs> yeah it's be interesting because he's the kind of person that'd probably leave after the wedding and try and skip the meal. <laughs> he's a he's a lo- he's just a, he's just such a lovely lad, and just the energy he brought on. I haven't seen him move like that in age. Like yeah, he was, he was great move. for the goal, even the little step. You know, he was I mean lithe and moving well. He was, but like yeah, no, he was. He took it well. Said the catch even earlier on. The shot was just such a her- Jesus. He didn't connect on it properly. No. And maybe he might say he did. It was a, a, spliced, a spliced miss hit, a dirty bouncy ball, and mm. there's four lads in the way of Aina Murphy. Like it, everything that could have went wrong with the strike went wrong, but yeah. it was the most perfect strike because even if he connected properly, I say Grealish would have got it in the helmet. But because he miss hit it, Grealish was gone past, and then it just it scutters in. But just even even the outpouring of emotion, definitely would see all the lads jumping on him, and apparently. Uh, you know, you'd see it on the big screen as well when lads were watching the back. They were all celebrating it twice when I'm out in the middle of the field, and then the big pile on. And even to see him emotional after the game was uh, it was lovely because I know how much it means to him. He really and truly is someone who has poured his heart into hurling with Kilkenny. Probably hasn't got the the reward that he deserves because of the injuries. But yesterday is just it's it's a it's a wonderful memory for him to take away whenever he retires. Okay, that's a magic insight. I do like to now imagine his fiance throwing her programme on the ground in disgust as the goal went in <laughs> well, she's, a, she's a good to her own woman anyway so she'd be delighted but at the same time it does add its own pressure now for the, for the next match um, it's very striking and so th- this is going to sound like a loaded question against Cody and it's not because the proof is in the pudding and he's the most successful manager most of us will see in Gaelic games in our lifetime but Derek Ling is so obviously a more personable character even in his media dealings. Uh, what, you know, through the grapevine, your sense of the environment, the Cody environment versus the Ling environment, what, what would be the big differences week to week, David, do you suspect? I'd say, first of all, Derek Ling deserves huge credit for the fact that he, um, normally when a management team kind of come in, they, it's it's clean slate, or they might keep on to one or two. Derek was very shrewd in what he did. He kept on to Connor Field, and there's not too many out-and-out coaches, top-quality coaches in Kilkenny, 
to the level of a senior intercounty experience, but Conor Phelan was one of them. So he kept on to Conor Phelan, he kept on to uh, Mickey Comerford, SNC, Jerry Fitz, psychologist, Noreen, the nutritionist back in again, obviously Racker, Kitman, uh, Nathan Coulson as well with SNC as well, um, Tyg, John Cairns. So he kept on to a lot of the medical and the backroom staff, um, which obviously straight away puts him on good stead then. Uh, heading into the new year that they all know he knows that the management team behind the scene know exactly what these players are, are dealing with that you're not coming in and three three months into it you find out that, that a certain player had done crucial that you know their new physio or the new the new SNC coach uh, is finding out this that he hit the ground running but he is such a Derek is a lovely lad Michael Rice is a, is a fantastic lad as well Connor Field and I wouldn't personally know Peter Barry too well now but just they, they are like even after the match yesterday you seen Derek Lane with the biggest smile on his face running out celebrating getting over into the huddle yeah. giving Killian a, a big hug after the match after Leinster final it is different I, I know I've kind of I've said it before but like when you kind of compare it to the 2014 when we celebrated the semi-final against Limerick and we were told to get the F off the field uh, by management you know like as in like don't be showing weakness yeah definitely a, to tougher, a tougher him. school for sure uh, yeah, but just enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the celebrations. The lads down in, in in front, just taking the photographs, and just even last night they're out there with uh, Mikey Carey as well outside the hospital as well with the cop. It's just, it's just there seems to be a very together group. It is. It's a it's a group where he's extremely approachable. Um, Derek Link. He's just a lovely lad that way. That you, you definitely can. Even when he was selector for years. He is someone that would geez, he'd say hello to you and he, he'd have a, an open conversation with you. And he was, yeah, look, he's, he's been there and he's done that as well. And he was always that kind of player with Kenny that everyone has a massive amount of respect for because he was that workhorse in midfield. Everyone has respect for Derek Lane. Yeah. Um, and, and he's brought that to it. And you just, the general sense that I would get is how are things in, inside the setup? And it just, players love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. They're buzzing to go into training. It looked that way. Uh, him running on the pitch, he just all spoke of very happy together uh, kind of camp. And again, that's not a word against Cody because how can you speak against what he achieved in the game? Christy, uh, give you a final word on the Leinster final. Uh, the Kilkenny stock for you? Yeah, look at Joe. Um, like David made a very good point there about you know the, the four week gap and like like when Kilkenny were at their peak, Joe. You know, I suppose when they were in their prime under Cody, like the, the, the biggest advantage they had was you know they knew like it was almost like every year they had that four week break, um, sometimes a five week break. Like they had it down to perfection, you know, where they go off in a training camp nearly the same time, same maybe weekend. You know, they they go back to play club matches. And obviously, it's changed now because there isn't any club games on anymore. But like I think even that they've they've had that now. Like you know that they know this terrain again. Like this is their fourth Leinster final in a row, and obviously to take out the twenty twenty championship. Um, so like they're comfortable with that four week break now. They know exactly this was how to get it right. Um, and you know they have it. They have guys to come back from yesterday that missed yesterday with injury. And you know you said Adrian Mullen coming back. Um, yeah, they're in a really good place. But um, where the, where might they be short? Where might they be short for you, Christy? Well, like I, I think for the, the big thing with Kilkenny is right is that you know you, you look at the go the goals that Galway um, conceded yesterday. You know I, I don't think you'd, you'd have seen that from Kilkenny. Um, like they're just they, they just seem to be hard to break down. Now you could say that Galway still scored what two twenty six yesterday, yeah, um, which is a lot. But like you, you always feel the weekly Kenny that you're going to need goals to beat them. Um, and like this was a team like Clare, a team like Tipperary, um, you know that could run at them. You know, um, you, you still wonder, Joe, is there caveats there? But like, you know, when you, when you look at what Clare last year, you know, in that semi final, Clare's never got out of the blocks. They just never physically, emotionally were at the races that day. And I think like obviously Clare have a lot to do. To, to get back to that to that stage, they have to you know give every respect to Carlo. Don't have to go to Carlo. If it's Dublin in the quarter final, that's going to be a tricky, tricky game for Clare. You know, an experienced management team, guys that have won all Irons with Gola before. You know, in that managing Dublin in that scenario. But I think if if Clare can get over that game, Joe, like you you would ask you know you would ask Clare this morning, and, you know, if you were to say to them. Back to the start of the year, right? You're in the middle of June. You've got to beat Dublin and Kilkenny to get to a final. I think that you know they, they fancy they fancy a crack at that. Now the, the question is how how are they going to respond from yesterday? Nobody knows that. Um, and I think if Clare can 
um, get to that stage and meet Kilkenny in the semi-final I think Clare will be much better prepared much better you know you look at the way Mikey Butler tied up Tony Kelly last year you know um, you, you imagine that won't happen again um, and just uh, I think Clare could ask questions of Kilkenny Joe that Gola didn't ask yesterday Okay. Not enough for them anyway Okay, we'll take a short break. I do want to talk to you about the Munster final, obviously. Uh, Christy O'Connor and David Herity staying with us. Back in one sec. Hurling on Off the Ball with Board Gosh Energy. Hurling, it's anyone's game. Now you're welcome back. Happy to say we have David Herity with us, Five All Ireland's Wickle Kenny, uh, Kildare manager these days, and Christy O'Connor, journalist and author. We were mainly focused on the Leinster final before the ad break, fellas. Let's talk Munster. I mean, it, it, on the. Uh, lack of freeze at the end for Claire like on the one hand David it's a big talking point on the other hand everybody agrees that the freeze should have been given so what more can you say and what's more uh, Claire if they're being honest with themselves will have other issues to address as, as to why they lost that game but we have to note it nonetheless like they really can feel aggrieved with the lack of freeze at the end it's a, it's a sickening way to lose a match probably had two freeze in there yeah, I, t- I thought the the last the last chance. If you're running into four Limerick lads, like and hurling, unfortunately, GEA as a whole, there's a there's a an awful epidemic coming into to GEA at the moment of of lads diving and taking freeze and throwing off the helmet. But like, if you're coming into three three big Limerick lads, you've got to throw a head back. You got to look like you're after getting hit. But just to, to jump off the two feet and go straight into three Limerick lads. You're the, I, I knew as soon as he actually had done it, I went, no, nah, you're not getting that free. Like, you've got to put the head back, shoot the head back. It's a bit of cuteness, and he just didn't have it. The Tony Kelly thing, I suppose the only thing is, obviously, we did see it at the time. The ball had shot off, and it was slightly over to the yeah. behind him. I'm it was, sure it was hard to see in real time. I didn't spot it at first. Yeah. yeah, the referee, I'm sure, was just watching the ball and waiting for... Like, you're obviously, your eyes are on the ball and not what's happening over here. Yeah. Like, how many times... I know you say it in, in, in rugby, and you saw it in the the Heineken Cup uh, that obviously the the last second the, the, the red card that happened there for Leinster because that went again that wasn't spotted in real time that was spotted obviously yeah. obviously on VAR so it's, it is unfortunate for the ref the biggest I'd say Claire don't you know, and I know Christy wrote, wrote about this there today in, in his column it's always brilliant column to read how the you know the free taking was, it was 45% that they had it um, you just can't, it comes back to other things the game you had chances there in the second half um, especially in that fourth quarter there where they just didn't take their chances mm. like you can hide behind the free but there were chances to actually get back and win that game and it is it is just unfortunate that the game ended the way it yeah. was even the, to blow up the short puck out and that the pitches invaded I thought the referee it just I don't know what would have happened obviously he would have went to extra time would have thrown the lens for final completely out of the shoot there but it was nearly it's just it's extremely disappointing for Clare when games end on a, on that kind of a nice edge where it's a referee decision that everyone's talking about a bit like the Dublin Cork minor football match uh, from the pre yeah. from the Saturday. So what I'm taking from this is is it right that David Herity does diving training with the Kildare hurlers? What once a month you work on it, David, or a bit more often than that? We got done a few times there this year where lads were taking dives, and I'm just thinking, are, you know, are we naive or is it just what's going on? Like how. How are we the ones that again don't seem to uh, get those frees? But it's a bit of cuteness. It's it's it is that bit of cuteness out there uh, to try and win a free and the ability to be able to win a free from any. You look at obviously Aaron Gillan and the the penalty that he got against Cork as well from holding on to the hurl. Yeah. Like it's that bit of cuteness that they seem to have. And uh, unfortunately for Clare, yes, they didn't have it. Well, spoken like a true manager because Brian Lowen said the same thing. We don't tend to get those uh, decisions. I wonder, do all managers feel that we don't tend to get those decisions? Um, it's, it, it honestly is. It's always that fine line between uh, lads. If you get hit, go down and. Lads, you stand up to that man today. You know yeah. that kind of a. If you know if he hits you, you, you make sure you stand up to him rather than geez, you get a hit, you get go down. Like it's 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 a fine balance, and I'm, I doubt Brian Lowen is going to talk about going into a monster final and backing down. Um, Christy, I'm, I'm curious. So you've you've mentioned a few times, like you weaved it through a conversation. You have concerns of, uh, clearly about what the round robin Munster provincial championship has taken out of these teams you can sort of spin this a whole bunch of different ways like the optimistic viewpoint from a Clare point of view uh, Clare point of view would be they were pretty profligate Lowen talked afterwards about a 50% conversion rate give or take Limerick up around 70% they had 12 wides 10 either blocked or dropped short or were saved um, so you're talking what 22 plus um, 
chances out of 44 created. So they'll feel like we left plenty out there. Uh, we really should have had at least extra time. Connor Cleary's shoulder gets another couple of weeks to rest up. Uh, we've gone toe to toe with Limerick, no problem. Fellas, we're in great shape here. Yeah, and look, let's be honest about it, Joe. Right? If if um, Clare to win the All Ireland this year, you know you're going to have to beat Limerick three times, right? So you're going to beat them three times, fairly unlikely. So now you're kind of saying, well, look at yeah, we still have a chance. Can, can you get them in a final? Now, I I still think if if Limerick are going to be caught, I think it's going to be the semi final. You've seen that in the last couple of years where, you know, they have the four week break. Um, like Limerick are still not operating at the levels they were, right? So now they're. The great champions to just find a way, Joe. Like you look at so many of those players, so many of their forwards yesterday. Like you know, you couldn't like Tom Morrissey has been their probably their best forward all year. You know, didn't have a good game yesterday by his standards. Gerard Hagerty still not operating at that level. Graham Mulcahy, um, you know, not at that level. Like they've really come in yesterday it was effective. Aaron Galea was obviously unbelievable. Seamus Flanagan was on the ball very little yesterday, but like you know, you go back to the last year's Munster final where Galea did a lot of the heavy lifting for Flanagan, who got eight points. Flanagan did a lot of that yesterday, especially the way he created the space for Galan. And so he much kind of a flip scenario really from last year. Um, and they're not scoring, you know, they're not scoring as much as they were last year, but they're still finding a way, Joe, like that they're still, they're grinding it out. Um, and they're so hard to beat in tight games. Like you go back to their, their last nine games, okay, they were beaten by Clare in the round robin this year. They drew with Clare last year in the round robin. They drew a tip this year. But like the six, six, the six games, they've won out of those nine. They've won it by one score. They've won the three games they won this year in Munster by two points, by a point once. They've become experts at winning these tight games. But I still think that there's, you know, they're they're not operating at that level. Um, now, if they get to a finals, nearly going to be half impossible to beat them because they're just, they, 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 they found that, you know, groove of, Producing their best performance in the All Ireland final, mm. um, so yeah, but like the, their Limerick are. Like if you go back to it yesterday, Joe, like for the killing thing for Clare, you can go on about them um, to freeze. You know, I've definitely felt that Tony won't show, should have been a free. Now Liam Gordon is looking at the play. Probably he's not looking at Tony because it's it's not directly involved in the play. Yeah. But um, like the conversion rate, really, like for me, the third quarter summed it up. Like the conversion rate was thirty percent in the third quarter. Where Limerick, it was up on ninety percent in that period. That's where Limerick really took control of the game. And Christie has like has has, um, has a poor conversion rate been a bit of a theme with Clare, or was yesterday a particularly bad day at the office? Well, it definitely wasn't in the like in the round robin that Clare's conversion rate was like Limerick sat it was fifty percent. Clare's was forty eight yesterday. It was forty two in the second half when Limerick was sixty five. Right. Um, and like that day in 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 the Gaelic grounds, like Clare's conversion rate when it was really decisive late on in the in the tour, in the last quarter, I think it was something like up on got to seventy percent. Like you know, thirty percent in the third quarter. Yes, it was when the game really got away from. Now it was better in the in the fourth quarter, um, but you know, like turned over a lot of ball in in that fourth quarter. You look at I suppose the turnover rate yesterday, Joe. Probably went up 33% in the second half. A lot of that from a clear perspective was, you know, you look at the way Limerick upped that intensity, the way they mount the ball, they physically turn over in the tackle. Clear turn over a lot of ball from like long deliveries, you know, ramming it down the throats of Limerick halfbacks, which is this, which is exactly what they want. But like as I said, it clear did finish the game very positively with, with a lot of momentum. As it was a threat that the game could, could get away from them. They were right there. Yeah. So, um, they they will feel like that. There's a lot more in them. There's a lot more in a lot of those players. Yeah, they, they don't feel like they're in the Galway situation at all here, Christy. No, no, definitely not. And I think Joe, look at I mentioned it last year. Whereas last year there was huge regrets about um, you know this was the way the year finished for Clare because you know when you, when you look back on it, they had a great year. They were unbeaten in the round robin. They were you know beaten really over seventy minutes in the Munster final. Got beaten an extra time. Wouldn't, you know when they looked at their numbers afterwards, sure they they realised that what you know, the energy they expended, the emotional and physical energy. Like, they should have been beaten by Wexford, let's be honest about it, in the quarterfinal. You know, went into the, the semi-final against Kilkenny, just never got out of the traps. Um, and I think, look, at the, there's probably a lot of lessons to be learned from that. Um, and I think Clare will still feel, Joe, like, look, at the, they're as good as anyone, you know, and um, that, you know, Killian Buckley mightn't have to worry about the wedding yet. Like, you know, so yeah. that's what Clare will definitely be thinking. Um, on the Limerick Clare work rate point, it was very interesting after after the Clare win in the Ren Robin stages. Kylie came out and said they outworked us, and uh, Ray Boyne had the stats of yesterday that basically in the, in the Clare win, 
on the hooks, blocks, tackles um, metric, Clare were ahead by just over 10. And Limerick managed to reverse that yesterday and they were ahead by 10. So that was clearly part of Limerick's thinking alongside the Clare um, wastefulness. David, there was something I wanted to ask you about, I guess as a coach, and obviously you've been in, in those brilliant Kilkenny dressing rooms as well. So the third quarter, Christy mentioned, won eight to three points in favour of Limerick. And that's not the first or last time, I think, that they'll win a third quarter. And John Kiley said afterwards, it's something we go after. I kind of find that odd as well at the same time. Like, would you not go after it in every quarter? I mean, like, I I don't really feel you can head out to the start of a Munster final and say, go at 80%, lads, and remember we got the third quarter in our back pocket. I find it's very strange that teams are even daring to pick and choose quarters. No, but at the same time, if you're if you're to say before a match, um, there's always kind of that the discussion and talk about before. You can say as much as you want and kind of rile teams up as much as you want before you go out to a match. But then as soon as they go out, they've half an hour of jogging and sprinting and a bit of pucking here and then extending and shooting over the bar. So regardless of how good your Braveheart speech is, it's it's all gone by the time the actual ball is thrown in. Whereas you can really go, you can really get an effect at half time if you question the team's character. If you're talking about, like, for instance, Dave outworked us in the first half and you're going pointing at someone, you could point at Carol Hegarty and go, what's that about? Like, You can piss a lot of people off at half time and really go after it and then you get an impact as soon as they go out onto the field, they can actually show you what they can do. So it's, uh, mm. I'm not surprised if, if that is the case. But I'm sure, look, they, they do go out to give it absolutely everything, but it's just at half time especially, you can pinpoint, you have the stats, they have a load of stats. They're, they're men obviously feeding them information you can just, obviously, you get your KPIs in there. It could be five KPIs there. It could be tackles. It could be conversion rate. It could be shots created. Whatever it is, but you can just go after one thing. Just give me one thing that I can absolutely nail these few lads on. Yeah. And again, it could be the forwards. And you're going straight after them. And again, then when you have a bench, like they have a bench, you can easily kind of have that threatened as well. So it, yes. it's a bit... It, they're, 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 that's why the third quarters for certain, te- certain teams actually work because... They have the stats, they have the bench as I suppose Trekman and you can really get out of that. You can piss a lot off very, very, very well at half time. Fair enough. Um Limerick is such an interesting place at the moment and David, like Christy summed up his sense, they're not quite where they were, but they're obviously going in the right direction I think this year they're improving game on game um, it's so I mean w- this championship is now so so much more interesting than I think many of us thought it was going to be after the league final when Limerick looked like uh, everybody was at arm's length it's now very clear lots of teams aren't quite at arm's length anymore and yet by the same token geez Limerick that's 12 finals on the bounce talk about a team who know how to win so your sense of Limerick's place in this All-Ireland series as it stands I think the fact that Keen Lynch still has to come back is obviously going to have a massive bearing. Like the reason why these some of these games are extremely tight is because they don't have that magician there at number eleven pulling the strings, the the double player of the year. I, I think the fact that they still have him in the locker is is key. I do think the semi final is going to be a, a massive game. I think I, I kind of fancied all year that if anyone's going to take them down, it would be Tipperary. I just think their ability to be able to run the confidence that they, the self confidence that they always seem to have, the confidence of the manager. Uh, I, I just I got the feeling obviously Tipperary have to get over Offaly and they have to potentially get over Galway but I think I agree with Christy that if, if anywhere they're going to get caught it's a semi-final that always does seem to be the one place where you can catch a team that's why, on the road Why is that? It's interesting you both think that why is that? Uh, there's nervousness about it. you're not in the final but in the final you can give absolutely everything and you're there and you're able to enjoy the build up and, and you've just had a one, you've had a wonderful build up you've had your I suppose all the glamour of getting the, the suited and booted and the 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 build up to a final is just a special occasion and you know you're gonna have a full house and it's just the kind of the banquet afterwards. It's just it's an occasion. But the semi final is just it, it's the final is there and it's within touch and distance and you just you're so bloody hungry to kinda of get back like Jesus, what would happen if you just got back to the final? It, it just it's all the, the the, the amazing things that happen because you get to a final. Sometimes that can just cause a little bit of nervousness there. Um, it's the four week gap as well can often do that as well yeah. because you are a small bit ring rusty you, you don't know where you're at because you could be after coming off a game like just say the Clare game there Limerick mightn't be happy of it so where really are Limerick in terms of they drew a tip they obviously lost to Clare as well they barely got over Cork like it, sometimes there can be a bit of 
you don't know exactly where you're at mm. at that stage as well. Whereas in the final, you've just come off the bat of, a, of an outstanding semi-final probably victory and you know exactly where you're at then. Christy, I'm really curious for your thoughts on, so we talked about the freeze and we talked about uh, players shooting. The other area that they'll reflect upon you would suspect is the damage that Galan did for the first 50 minutes of this game. And that it was at that point that they took off Keane Nolan in for Cleary and his importance I think is, you know, uh, further underlined and they'll be doing everything they can to sort out that shoulder. So at first glance, you say, well, Keane Nolan's not tight enough to Galan. But then I think... You, you watch this developing and Conlon's being dragged up away up the pitch and you kind of think well like there's a degree of Keen Nolan here being a lamb to the slaughter and I mean can anyone mark Galan effectively when he has that much space and that quality of ball going into him very very difficult even for the goal like I didn't feel Nolan was standing off Galan as such dramatically now the argument obviously uh, against Lowe and not moving quicker is that once the change was made Galan didn't score again from play so that, that's that's an area Claire really needs to think about. Uh, Nolan's performance, first of all, and, and the extent to which you know he was culpable, or the extent to which he was uh, thrown to the wolves a touch, Christy. Yeah, well, look at Joe. I suppose you know you have to look at I suppose the quality ball has gone in first, and all it's a basic cliche kind of response. But like really, with the likes of Galan and these guys, it, you know you you can't play from the front, Joe. Because if you do with the ball, like Galan is very good in the air from behind. Ball goes in behind your yeah, pot. He loves if you that. Get too tight, if you get too tight to a guy like Galan, he can turn you that bit quicker. If you look at even Tino and his body position for the goal, he was tight. Now he did maybe get caught on the outside a little bit. Yeah. But um, like in fairness to the, the Sunday game, as that like they did show the high behind. Don Low showed it very well in the Sunday game, whereby like John seemed to be deeper up up the field as opposed to you know sitting back maybe that bit more. Now, look at I suppose the, the way it is has been with Clare and Limerick, Joe, is that Clare have they believe that they have the physical capacity to go man to man with Limerick, you know, and they're the one team that they feel they can physically front up to Limerick. And that's grand to a point. Now we, we, I suppose it's a little bit different when you lose a guy like Connor Cleary because you go back to that monster final last year where um you know like it was, it was Flanagan who did all the damage last year. Um, now Galan did a lot of damage as well but like I suppose you like, you can imagine Aaron Galan's mindset when Conor Cleary is named to start and then he finds out that Conor Cleary is not starting and you have a Keen Nolan who's a very good player who, who is a physically strong player but you know you need somebody like for Galan now I would have felt that okay with Keen he was on a yellow card after 30 minutes you know um, it, it is crying out for a change like mm-hmm. you have your two cornerbacks who are Adam Nolan and um, and you know Rory Hayes, uh, sorry Adam Hogan and Rory Hayes were playing really well. You know, is that a case where you know you make the switch there? You try and you know maybe give the responsibility to one of them. Like I, they, they did bring on Shane Amory, who did have a fine game. Like it, you know, I suppose would Shane really, you know, you kind of need somebody like a really, a really kind of a dog for Galan. You know, was Shane that type of a player? Like you know, Paul Flanagan went in, who was a very experienced player. Like Claire definitely did seem to get it right. Um, but you know, the, 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 I suppose the big questions asked is why do you leave it that long when you have a guy who has gone in and who is not had, doesn't have the same level of experience that a Conor Cleary has? But you know, like Galan and these guys, like Galan is he's an expert. Like because you, you try and keep him outside. I suppose with Galan, you try not to concede a goal. You keep him outside. He'd shoot all day from the outside. He's one of the best guys to shoot over his shoulder, Joe, that you've ever seen in the game. So you are going to, no matter how many balls, like Galan had what eleven possessions, 11, 12 possessions. He was fouled for three frees. He gets one three. Could have had another goal. Yeah. Like, really, like, you know, Dale mentioned it on Saturday and he's calling him like that. If Conor Cleary was there, he said he'd uh-huh. fancy. If Conor, Conor Cleary was fit, he'd fancy Cleary. If he wasn't, he'd fancy um, Limerick. And I suppose that's really, you know, that was a matchup that Limerick clearly identified. That Limerick, you know, you see the way Flanagan played further off the pitch, that they wanted to try and create as much space and open up, the, open up those channels, maybe pull Conlon out a bit higher. To give, you know, you know, the, and the way things work out, you know, every team is getting information somewhere. They probably the fair dear Conor Cleary was not going to start. Limerick said, "Look at this, where we're going to win the game," and did, did Clear manage that situation as well as they possibly could? You'd have to say, you'd have to say no. Yeah, I, uh, David, found myself thinking back to that 2016 All Ireland hurling final, Kilkenny Tip, where. I can't remember, you know, names necessarily, but like the two Kilkenny defenders were left two on two acres of space in front of them. And it was like <laughs> inevitable conclusion. And I'm sure Keen Nolan could have done better, but I did find myself thinking, well, look, Cleary's not there. 
maybe you do need to adjust your tactics and protect a bit more. Like if you were in the goal, would you not have been screaming for some cover? Yeah, it was actually Joey Holden, yeah, and Seamus Callan. I think Seamus got nine points. That's right, that yeah. yeah. And there was yeah, very little he could do that day on him. There was, yeah. No, the, the big thing, obviously, look, Brian Lowen had his full trust and belief in, in who he chose to start, but I, I would have thought once the yellow card happened, uh, you know, then you then you have to change because you can't have Galan running knowing that the, that as Markham is going to have a yellow card. Every single ball that's going to come in, he's going to take you on. He's clever enough to know that. It's a bit like Owen Cody yesterday. Every time that uh, you know he knew Mannion was on a, a yellow card and ran at him, and then got another couple of frees. He knew he could he, that Mannion couldn't actually get those tackles in. So it's a that I'd say after forty five minutes, that should have just been that gone. Uh, it's whipped straight away, and uh, I'd say that's the thing that's probably going to sometimes as well. Though on the management side of thing, when you when you make a, a ballsy enough decision that this is who I'm going with, and I'm, I'm I'm putting this man on their main man, yeah, and then all of a sudden it's not going well. Sometimes it's hard to swallow your own pride and go, okay, I made a bag to that and got it wrong. Yeah, yeah, it's a fair point. Um, Christy, uh, this is like feels like one of the more celebrated uh, years of hurling. Dennis Walsh did a piece a while back about like this being a golden age, and I mean, right through the Munster Championship, we seem to be just served feast after feast. What would you say in terms of like a historical context as someone who looks at the stats and who um, obviously just has a great feel for the game as well? Are we watching something very, very special at the moment? And and and, and give us your your sense of why that is. Yeah, like I would definitely feel, Joe, like that. Um, if you if you go through it forensically, I'd, you'd have to you have to say that this was probably the, the greatest monster championship ever. And when you go back to 2018, which you know was a that was the first year in the own Robin, and that was an incredible year as well. Like you know, you you look at it, and, you know, go through it. Like 19 was not a good Leinster, cha- was not a good monster championship. 20 obviously was different. It was yeah. you know the old kind of system was not was average. 21 was was okay. Um, Last year, there was still, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, it wasn't the same quality. Um, like, I, I think, like, the, you know, the, if, you, if you go through, look, look at how competitive it is. Like, if, if Cork and Limerick had drawn, um, it would have been a Cork clear much to yes, and Tip would be gone out of the championship. Like, you know, the, the jeopardy is there is just off the charts. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just, uh, um, and this, this goes back to the point I made, like, that, you know, I think that was something that from, from Limerick, from Limerick's perspective, Joe, that I was a little bit surprised that they went for the league. Now, John Kiley said that it was that was the player's decision, but you knew well that every game Limerick played in Munster was going to be a huge event. You know, the first two games were lucky to to, to beat Waterford. Like, you know, they were okay. Waterford or Limerick were down fourteen men, but like that was the first time you you know you saw it probably Limerick dictated to tactically in a championship match in, in a long time. You know, obviously lost their second game to to um to Clare. Um, and I suppose that kind of gave a different feel as well, Joe. The people, you know, suddenly realised, well, this is not going to be the, the the walkover that everybody expected it to be after the league final. Um, and you know what? No, like Limerick have they've had to go to the well. They've drawn a tip. They've had to go to the well to beat Cork by a point, to be clear by a point. The big the, the big price for them is the four week break. Now, um, yeah, like. You still feel that the Leinster teams, Kilkenny in particular, are look are sitting back now and they're in a happy enough spot. I think the biggest thing from from a hurling perspective, Joe, there's no question that the the, the standard, the quality, the execution levels, the skill, everything is gone to new levels. But I still think that there is an issue like that the game, and this is tied into the 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 you know the the final moments of the Munster final yesterday. The game is nearly becoming impossible to referee. Like it's just you know it's. Like okay, Liam Gordon, you know, and I suppose the other thing is you've had a since you've had a few big retirements in hurling, you've you really have a dearth of high quality referees. Okay, so like the game is well, it's never been at a, in in so in in a better spot in so many ways. Like it's it's actually become nearly impossible to referee. You know, that is an issue. Like so, like how do you get around that? Like we we'll say because you know the players now are conditioned to take the ball into contact they're conditioned to break the tackle the players have the, have bought, the ball in their hand so much now and that feeds into this you know um, this craze of turnovers you know so down the line you know I think that Hurland is in a brilliant place I still think it, it has somewhere to go now you know where, where does that go to make it even better again to make it more where there's more contests I know you've had this debate on the show plenty of times before where there isn't as many contests as you'd like 
You know, there was a rule brought into the in the trial in the National League in '95, where you could only take possession. You could only have the ball in your hand for one possession. You know, is, is, do we need to look at something like that again? So, to answer your question, probably the greatest monster challenge. It sounds like a, a kind of a contradiction in what I'm saying. Like, but I still think that Hurling has a few questions to ask Joe to make it even a better product than what it is and there's no question that it's an absolutely incredible product I just I'd like to even think like to even know what Dave thinks of that because you know that's the, that's, that is the problem the game is becoming just nearly unrefereable in so many instances well he's coaching I, I he's, he's coaching diving week in week in in Quebec <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Certainly, I'm not. Uh, I don't see why uh, you don't have referees as umpires. I, it's beyond me how you, how one of. That, or whoever it is, it could be your mom, it could be your brother or sister, it doesn't make a difference that you could go along and uh, don't have a top quality inter county ref pay them and make sure that you have extra eyes and ears then at a match and they're able to make decisions. Ball comes in there, it could be, for instance, it could be, uh, just say, get back to that Galan penalty there when it came to the, the Cork match to, to go along and be able to walk in and the referees know everything. They know yeah. the decisions, they know the, the actual rules of the game. All it is, like, if you look at it, Again, if you look at soccer, you have the two, everyone that's there are proper referees that are officiating, the, the linesmen, the extra, the, the fourth official. Why can't, uh, why can't in Ireland, that, especially when the ball is moving as quick as, he, as it is, with the decisions that they have to make, um, why they just can't have four referees there as umpires extra? Uh, it, it, I think to me, it's a, it's a simple answer to, uh, rather than getting the two, the two referees out in the field, I just think, I don't know how the hell that would work. It's confusing. Yeah. But having referees are top quality. Any sort of referees whatsoever that know the rules of the game, have them as umpires rather than just your mate down the ball. Yeah, it's a good start. Here's a terribly unfair question, David, given that the provincial uh, championships have come to a close. If you're giving out hurler of the year today, who is it? Oh, Jesus. Um, you'd, ha- you'd have to say Galan. Yeah. I'd say, or Tom Marcy. I know he didn't have the, the best of games there Yes, uh, I'd say you'd have to go with the two of them could Kenny have had you all are another outstanding game there yes and Paddy Deegan probably from the, the Kenny side of things but I don't think Kenny's team is, is settled enough at the moment they've had a lot of injuries they've had lads coming in and out that's probably the, the biggest question mark over Kenny or the, what they'll be happy enough with for the next four weeks to try and nail down their team but if I was going for them I'd probably go you Paddy Aaron Galan or Tom Morrissey yeah, yeah Christy yeah, I think, look, you'd have to say that Galan is really a mirror reflection of, of, of Limerick in the championship, Joe, like that, you know, struggled a bit, go a bit early on in the campaign, like even today against clearing the row, Robin, like missed a couple of handy frees by his standards. But, you know, you look at the way he's come back in, you know, the last few games and, you know, Tom, was, Tom Morris, he really was, was what you'd say was Limerick's best player for so much of the, of the, of the championship. When you look at the games that have been decided, Galan has been key. And I think that Galan probably... You know, you look at the way he has improved, the way Limerick have improved, and um, I think that they're they're getting better. Mm. They're sorry, they're not sorry, they're not operating at the levels they were, but they're still so hard to beat. You want to go back to that point about that they're experts to win at tight games. Um, not sure if they're going to win the All Ireland, but they're look, they're they're a great, great team. Like, no, anyone who's watching this from Limerick is saying, <laughs> "So great, some clear, it's not." They're they're an unbelievable team. Are they going to win the All-Ireland? I'm still not 100% sure. Okay, it's all beautifully set up. The only, uh, set up, the only downside is uh, July 23rd is approaching far too fast and then February feels like a long way away. But that's another conversation. We are out of time. David Herity, pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joe. Thanks so much. Christy O'Connor, great to talk to you, Christy. Cheers. Pleasure, Joe. Thank you. Take care. There you go. That was David Herity, five-time All-Ireland winner with Kilkenny and uh, Kildare manager these days and Christy O'Connor, journalist and author uh, with us talking all things hurling and uh, should mention as well on that theme, Off the Ball have teamed up with the Senior Hurling Championship sponsors Board Gosh Energy to uncover stories highlighting the positive impact hurling has on people's lives and for full competition details you can check out boardgoshenergy.ie forward slash BGE GAA. Hurling on Off The Ball With Board Gosh Energy Hurling, it's anyone's game